Welcome to Leadership and Life Chat with your hosts, me, Becky Ames. And me, Mark Curtis. In each episode, we'll be illustrating how success in leadership is inextricably linked with success in life. Whether it's leadership in business, society, family or friends, we're all leaders. Using our experiences and a range of expert guests, we'll share secrets to boosting your health, wealth and self. So let's get on with the show. Traditionally, leadership and management has been very much around IQ. How intellectually intelligent are you? Today's special guest, Antonio Garrido, talks to us about insights and EQ and how the world and landscape of leadership and management have changed and what we need to do to remain relevant as leaders today. You'll probably notice that I'm on my own on the show again today. Becky, unfortunately, has got caught in some floods. Um, Hopefully she makes it home safely, but it's just me. So, Antonio, welcome to the show. Antonio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> very, uh, very glad to be here. Very honoured to have been invited. Thank you. I'm a big fan of the show. So, Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, and we're a fan of your work as well. So a uh, bit of a mutual appreciation society here. For, for, the, li- <laughs> nice. for, for, for the listeners who, who haven't heard of you, don't know about, about your journey, would you like to just share with them, you know, how you've got to this point in your life? Oh, gosh. Do you want the... Um, Short, medium, or long story. The long one's only interesting, probably, to me and my mum. So, to um, the shorter one, I guess, is well, I came out of university a million years ago because I'm fairly ancient um, as an architect. So, I originally uh, studied architecture and uh, went into architecture. Most architects, I think, I haven't spoken to that many but certainly enough of them but I think most architecture students at any rate imagine that when they come out of school with their or university with their degree in their hand they'll be designing cathedrals and (laughs) and airports and you know just museums and all of that good stuff and most of them I guess kind of certainly me at any rate kind of was Mrs. Miggins's kitchen extension, and and not that that wasn't okay, and you know you got to start somewhere and build up, right? So I was into all of that, and I knew that I would eventually get there. But I found myself purely by luck rather than judgment, and I think a lot of careers, if you're not very intentional about them, can go that way, where it's more by luck than judgment. Um, working for an organisation where the the managing director took a particular shine to me. I'm not entirely sure why. Oh, actually, I am. It's because he he told me that he appreciated that I told him the truth, and we're probably going to be talking about the truth later. Mm. Um, and that was in a pretty much short supply. So um, he kept promoting me, and uh, I eventually found myself. Well, he said to me one day, "I, I you know, I think you're destined for." different things and I thought am I, am I being fired I thought this was very <laughs> odd <laughs> but he seemed jolly enough I thought if he was firing me he'd look slightly more pained but he said so I'd like you to I'd like you to go into management rather than you know stay you know kind of designing and I don't to this day know whether it was just a a, a very gentle way of saying you're not a very good architect so it may have been that right but anyway so he said I think you're destined for better things or bigger things rather so um when you go back to university and do an MBA or something in business management strategic business management or leadership or some sort of you know leadership more business than uh, design we'll pay and we'll look after you and do all of that and then when you come back we'll give you even more bigger and better things. So I did that. So I thought it was a huge compliment. And of course, indeed it was. And then I found myself running in the European division. And then just kind of, I. Uh, so I'm now not an architect, right? I'm now, I'm now leadership. I mean, management kind of by accident um, uh, or rather by luck rather than design. So, um, but the, the chap I was working for, this particular individual was one of the most forward thinking just it had enormous gravitas there's such a smart 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 guy and i was super lucky and i i tried to learn from him voraciously and then um my the rest of my roles thereafter were just leadership bigger and bigger and bigger and leadership bigger and bigger and bigger until to the end i was 
found myself. I just sort of turned around one day and I was running a like a like a top sixty PLC with thousands of people and billions in revenue. And I'm like, is this my life? I'm like, how did this even kind of happen? Um and then just kept doing that. And then eventually uh most of those individuals do, or well, not most of them, but a lot of them, they go into consultancy. And I was the consultant for the NHS for a while, because we all know how dreadful the NHS is, right? Um, and so I did that for a while. Um, and then I guess come to this to answer your question rather clumsily and not very succinctly at all. I, I then got a, a role, very, very large role, looking after Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific Rim, like most of the world, really. They had headquarters in Taiwan and Dallas. Okay, why is that important? Because my brother at the time, he was the CFO of a pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca and out of Miami. He looked after uh, AstraZeneca South America, but it, it, that was, it, it operated out of Miami. So every time I went to a board meeting in Dallas, I'd go to Miami to see my brother and my nieces and nephews and so on. Oftentimes take my wife because, you know, why not? And so we were about to be empty nesters. And my wife and I said, hey, listen, why don't we take this opportunity, <laughs> opportunity of getting rid of all the kids, right? Well, we have four kids, but why don't we take this opportunity and kind of like do something completely different and new and reinvent ourselves? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm always up for that. What, what do you have in mind? So she said, well, let's go. Let's buy the kids somewhere to live. <sighs> of course, they were living with us at the point. But what, let's buy the kids somewhere to live and let's go and live in Miami. Right. So this was like an absolute pivotal, pivotal point in our life. Right. A real inflection point. And I said, yeah, OK, cool. Let's go to Miami. So we thought, <laughs> foolishly enough, that we could just kind of pack our suitcases and buy a ticket to Miami and show up. Right. But the American government had other thoughts <laughs> on the matter. You can't just show up. Right. You need a reason to be there. So uh, if you become an investor. You know, if you throw enough money at anything, I suppose, in America, they can, they're they they're fairly relaxed about it. So we bought a business, is what we did. And then they let us in. They said, oh, well, if you bring in just a suitcase and full of cash with you, come on in. <laughs> so we bought a business in Miami. And uh, over the next 10 or 12 years, developed that into probably the third largest sales training company in the world. So we did rather well for ourselves. And then I wrote a couple of books on the back of that, which were great, both both books did really well. Um, and then I wrote this book a few years ago, right? Which is, I guess, why we're talking today, mm -hmm. right? For leaders. Anyway, so we're in Miami. I thought I've got so much. I've been now coaching and leading, training leaders for years. Worked for some of the best leaders. I think genuinely world-class leaders, not just kind of best in class, but world-class leaders. I was that fortunate. And I thought, well, I have a few things to say about leadership, right? Since I've been coaching probably the biggest leaders in the world. My coach, he, he coaches presidents of um, countries as well as presidents of companies, right? Has been had been encouraging me to do it forever. So, so we we kind of created this breakaway brand, which is this my daily leadership. So we didn't want to confuse it with the kind of the sales and the sales management and that sales leadership and to actually kind of like CEO, C-suite and leadership stuff. So I wrote this book, not under that brand, but under this brand. And we started this business. And yeah, and here we are today. That that was fantastic. I mean, what what a great story. And, you know, as you were talking, there was there was lots of things spinning around in my head. I think that one of the early things which came out, which you said, is you went into a profession and then you moved into management. And and I think probably through, you know, what what I've done for a living as a as an accountant by trade, and what I see with my clients or the businesses I act for, people almost fall into management a lot of the time. You, yours was a much more structured route because, as you said, you had a very forward-looking boss who, who who was very much into developing managers and leaders. And and I think the world has got better at it over the last 20 years. But mm -hmm. the majority of us, 80%, I would guess, of the world stumble into management because they get promoted because they're good at their day job not because they're necessarily a good manager. And and then it's then the work really starts, doesn't it? Because just because you're a good accountant, architect, you know, 
doctor, whatever it might be, doesn't mean you're a great manager or leader because it's a completely different skill set. So I'm guessing, you know, with with what you do now with my daily daily leadership, you see this all the while, which is people get promoted into roles which they they don't necessarily have the skills. They're not equipped to deal with those roles just because they're good at what they do in their chosen profession. I, I'm going to go further than that, if I might. <laughs> So, you know, I can only, again, speak from my experience, but as I mentioned, I'm fairly ancient and I've been doing this a long time, right? From tiny, small companies, you know, startup and one, one-off entrepreneurs and so on, all the way up to uh, massive companies of one of our clients with, you know, we have 52 leaders that we're looking after. That's just in one client. It's a very large organization. Revenues begin with a B, not an M, right? Mm. And we see it more often than you imagine. And um, typically, just as you say, what's happened is somebody is a good insert your role and then for whatever reason above them becomes vacant and they think, well, who's the best one of these that we have? Oh, well, it's Frank. Oh, well, then Frank, you know, tick your it. I don't want to, I, I can't even imagine the percentage. Let's say 90%. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's very, very high. The, the chap, you know, I'd use that term generically right so that could be a, a, a man or a woman but so the, the chap that they then promote who's really good at his job the the double whammy is they've lost all of that skills and expertise and experience down there right and they've moved somebody that isn't at all prepared already or sometimes <laughs> even realizes what job they've applied for they just go oh how much is an increase in salary all right that'll do for me right and then they take the role imagine it's a lot easier than it is and then, so the double whammy is now you have somebody that isn't tremendous looking after a division or an organization. I often ask, I often ask, and here's a question that maybe your leaders can ponder. Maybe I'll give you the answer at the end, right? What's better, a poor plan well executed or a, or a good plan poorly executed, <laughs> right? So, so, so you've got somebody that's now... Um, you know, who's doing well at their job, gets promoted and has really no concept of what management is or, or sometimes if they're a management manager, what leadership is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I mentioned before we started, not today, but, you know, in previous conversations that we've had, that my favourite well, football team is Manchester City, right? So there'll be some lunatics now switching off if you think it's Manchester <laughs> or Liverpool or Norwich heaven forfend, right? Of course, I'm biased, but I would argue that Pep Guardiola is the best football manager on the planet. If he's not, then he's certainly in the top five or six, right? Yeah. Um, But he was a fairly, at best, (laughs) at best, dreary football player, right? He wasn't very good at all, right? Um, Not really much of a career to speak of. And then you get some other players who are, phenomenal players, right? Phenomenal players who go into management, dreadful, right? So there's no correlation between a good architect and a good you know, manager of an architectural practice or owner of an architectural business. There's no link, there's no link other than, you know, an appreciation perhaps for what the, some, of the, some of the individuals do, you know, in some of the departments of the organization. And like you say, when you look at, uh, a lot of leadership, you know, boardrooms, C-suites, when you look at them, most of them have got to that role through a functional skill or responsibility. So so you'll get the CEO came through, sometimes they come through finance, right? So, that, so it's the CEO with a very finance-based kind of mentality and mindset. And then we have, we have other that have come through a sales or a marketing function, and some have come through logistics, well. So... And they they look at the world. You know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? They look at the world through that kind of functionality more than... And it's natural. So not only are we doing the... Have we got a square peg in a round hole? We also then have to do with, okay, how do we remove the blinkers from this individual? I I heard a tremendous interview with Rory Sutherland from um, who's the joint chair of Ogilvy, David Ogilvy, one of our very, very, very best uh, British 
success stories and just a, a tremendous individual. If, ben, if if you don't know what we're talking about, if any of you seen Mad Men, that was kind of based loosely on Dave, David Ogilvy. But genius, 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 and employed geniuses. We talk a lot about David Ogilvy in the book because he's that that important. But anyway, Rory uh, Sutherland was was talking about. Um, how some consultants went into a, a, a hotel. And all of these consultants were effectively of a, of a financial bent, shall we say. And again, I know who I'm talking <laughs> about. Please <laughs> don't get all your hackles raised, right? <laughs> and so this consultant, these consultants, looked at this hotel and were trying to make improvements to the hotel. They saw that there was a doorman and they thought to themselves, well, what does this doorman do? It just kind of opens and shuts the door. So if we uh, got rid of the doorman, right, the front of the hotel, and we put an automatic sliding door in, right, it will maybe cost us £30,000. Within, within six or nine months, we paid for itself. In three years, you know, we made £100,000. And it, on paper, looks tremendous. Like, it makes such great sense to do so. so. So they did so. So the doorman was replaced, and an automatic sliding door was you know, put in the place. Not realizing, of course, that a doorman does just much more than just open and close the door. It greets people. It helps people with luggage on and off. It helps people with directions. It's part of the experience and part of the whole service thing. But on a on a on a functional line of somebody's budget, it kind of looked a bit kind of excessive. Three years later, there's litter in the entrance hall. After twelve o'clock, they have to put some kind of lock and finger pad and all of that kind of stuff and it makes it very difficult. There's no one behind reception at that time to release the thing. Right. And they wonder why they've saved their hundred thousand, but why is their rack rate down 40% three years later? Because they got rid of the tournament, right? So it's like this yeah. whole false economy. So whenever we see that a CEO is effectively, you know, um ha has come through the finance route, we spend some time getting them to understand what all of the other functions do, mm -hmm. right? One of the, there are some great companies. I think it was um, certainly Ford Automobiles, America. I don't think it was the current CEO. I think the one before, he was from Newcastle, right? So global CEO of Ford was from Newcastle and he started on the production line in Newcastle. Yeah. Right, and, and worked his way up da, 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 and eventually found himself in America um, as the CEO of the organization. Now, I love that because this individual not only stayed with the company all that kind of time, but on his route up, did many, 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 many jobs and understands the business kind of from, from grassroots, from the very, very cold face to the, you know, to the very top of the, uh, of the organization. Whenever we see that, we think, oh, terrific. So when people have a broad experience, right? So yeah, I did three years in marketing, then I did two years in accounts, so I did three years in logistics, and then found myself at the board. We think, terrific, this, this guy would be good. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing that I've seen through my career, because it's the easiest thing to talk about, because I've lived that one through my own eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's a similar thing, you know, with it within Larkin Gowan, I was able to do multiple different roles. I was able to be involved in our corporate finance department, which is when, when you're seeing businesses being bought and sold, it brings a completely different perspective to the accountancy side. I ran our marketing department for a while. But the one thing which I think I've probably seen at probably at about the age of 26 or 27 um what what would have been an, an enlightened partner back in the day said to me how much time are you devoting to management and leadership each week mark and i said i don't know he said well if i was you i'd be looking at 10 percent of your working week so we do you know 37 and a half hours i would be looking at investing four hours a week into leadership and management and leadership and and for me that was a real you know, I've always had a thirst for knowledge. I'm interested. I want to know how stuff works. I want to test it to destruction. I want to take it to bits and put it back together again. Yeah, you know, it's just how I'm wired as a human and how I've been brought up. And suddenly I looked at it and I thought, right, okay, you know, Larkins were quite forward looking even back then. They had some leadership courses you could go on, but nice. it, but it was still only going to be one course every however many months. Do you know what I mean? And it, yeah. so so it, the, the the penny really dropped for me, which is if I want to develop my career and I want to become a great manager and then a great leader, I've got to invest in myself as well. This isn't just down to the business. This is down to me. So nice. I've been on a 25, well, 25 year journey nearly now of building a career within the business, but also building my management and leadership career, which is 
which, which join together clearly because it's what you do but yeah. it's not the day job you know it's it developed into the day job so i've bought virtually every book under the sun on leadership and management and mindset i've nice. had blinkist for years where i dip in and out of stuff so so yeah. and, and it's not because every book is you know i i don't look at it as everything is a uh is a magic bullet but i look at every book as if i can take one thing away that i can do differently or apply in a different way then that book is worth its weight in gold and and i think you know very often we, we see clients and, and even people within our own organization I, I see this is a personal view they they want to become better leaders and managers and maybe this is a generational thing it's like well, what course are you going to send us on you know or i don't need to do that because this, this stuff will just develop as i mature and and i i fundamentally disagree with it i don't think it it doesn't happen by chance this is this is more by design you have to you have to plot your leadership career as well as your architectural or accountancy career they, they go hand in hand 100%. i'm not quite sure there's a question in there what what do you oh, think <laughs> what do you think that's that <laughs> good get out of jail free card <laughs> thoughts so um yeah I come, i've got so much to unpick there that's, that's <laughs> i am um, so wholeheartedly agree first of all to say um i i i think you and i think along very very similar lines I, I, for every organization or by the time i got to a position that was senior enough that i could make this decision without anybody raising an eyebrow um i said to anyone in the organization because i i'm with you those that want to just wait and passively be spoon-fed their training and development I'm not too interested in, but those who are very intentional about it, I love that. Whenever we start talking to, you know, even before we engage with clients, kind of when we're kind of like kind of dancing around the handbags and trying to figure out whether we've got similar core values and so on with, with a prospect, one of the questions I'll ask the, C, the senior, the C-suite guys, right? I'll ask them individually, do you want to be a, 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 an okay leader? Do you want to be an average leader? Do you want to be a good leader? Do you want to be a best in class leader? Or do you want to be a world class leader? And for those that go, yeah, no, pretty good, <laughs> right? I go, okay, then I don't. I, 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 let me suggest some other companies you might talk to <laughs> because we're probably not the ones for you. Yeah. And and for every organization I've worked for, well, as I say, I've seen you enough that didn't raise an eyebrow. Um, I said, if anybody buys any business related book so it's, it's not like the ne the latest stephen king thriller but if anybody <laughs> buys any business related book and then reads it and gives it to anybody else in the organization you can expense it as many as you like right you can expense it. as you read it and then if it's any good give it to someone else in the organization mm -hmm. because for a 20 pound book you can get a hundred thousand pound benefit right mm -hmm. the other yeah. thing is every time anybody becomes a client of ours we naturally send them a book, of course, because we say, read this book before we kind of start our engagement. But actually, we always, whenever we engage with them, we send them to, we say, read this book and give this other one to anybody else, right? And we're not yeah. doing that just so we can sell more books, but <laughs> that is you know, a benefit. So we always, we kind of sell our books in pairs, read one and give one to somebody else. One of the other bosses, leaders I've worked for, not the one I mentioned earlier, the one that said, I think you should go back to school, right? Not that one. He, he had this, it's pretty gruesome, um, grisly, let's say, uh, expression. But he would ask people, he would say, um, what have you learned today, right? And he would follow it up with, just to make sure that everybody understood how important that is. He would say, so what have you learned today? Because remember, the only advantage we have today over yesterday is what we learned, because otherwise we're just a day closer to dead, right? That's what he would say 50 times a week, right? It, almost exactly that word for word, right? I mean, that's it's quite a shocking, but at the same time, amusing, because you smile and I smile and everybody does when they hear it. That's how important learning was to him. And, and if you said, well, I haven't really learned anything, I don't think I've learned anything these last couple of days, he'd be visibly disappointed mm -hmm. another way he would ask the same question is where have you failed this week and if you if you couldn't say if you couldn't point to a failure this week so this is just imagine that encouraging failure 
right? If you hadn't failed, you'd be disappointed. And he said, well, then you're probably not trying hard enough, right? And Mario Andretti, the old racing car driver, he said, if you're not terrified going through the corners, you're just not going fast enough, right? which I kind of love. So if you haven't failed this week, um, then it's a it's a wasted week. It's a week, week wasted because it means you haven't learned anything because you only learn something, according to him. Well, one of the ways is by failing. It's like, what's the absolute best way? In fact, the, really the only way to learn how to say ride a bike. The best way to learn how to not fall off a bike is to fall off a bike. I <laughs> go, well, I'm not doing that again, right? Yeah. So, so he was very much, what have you learned? Where have you failed? And encourage all of those things. Now, if the failure is repeated again and again and again and again, that's a different story because you're not learning, right? So yeah. you're only learning if you don't repeat those failures. But it does a tremendous amount for creativity, collaboration, you know, if you're encouraged to fail, because if people are fearful of failure, you know, for fear of reprisals, reprimands, whatever, it makes companies incredibly insular and blinkered and silos and not my, you know, not in my backyard, not invented here mm. syndrome. These are our sacred cows. You've got your sacred cows and all of that terrible stuff. So this principle that you talk about learning and develop and taking responsibility for your own learning and development, it's almost like dress for the role that you want to have, isn't it, right? Mm. If it wasn't for that, our business wouldn't exist. So I'm yeah, a big absolutely. And, and as you were talking there, you, you I'd scribble something down here as you were talking about the, um, you know, what have you learned? You know, moving you move forward with it and, mm -hmm. and i scribbled down the creative act a book a book i read earlier this year by rick rubin um mm -hmm. and he talked very much around being you know we're vessels no one is creative no one's not creative we're just vessels for creativity oh, and the yes. more we widen our horizons and expand our views of things the more creative we become because it flows through us and out of us and and i think that you know it's exactly what i think you were talking about there with with your with your old boss which is if you're learning something you've got more scope to become creative because you're allowing more stuff to flow through you. The The other thing I was then thinking as well is I, I mentioned earlier, you know, I've got about uh, approximately 74 million business books and mindset books in the house. Um, I also have approximately the same amount of, um, of, of non business books as well, because I find that if I read and I'm not talking fiction necessarily here, but just books on anything, it could be, you know, it could be about the environment or anything. It, it challenges your thinking in a different way. And yeah. what I then find is from a business point of view, I can then channel that that thought process back into and apply it to business. So although it's nothing to do with business, it's everything to do with business. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. not just about the obvious stuff either. It's about going left field at times as well. It, it, it is. I, I, I picked up a, a book the other day. It's about making information beautiful. It's like, it's a, it's a design book. So obviously, because mm. I've still got that architectural gene <laughs> trying to <laughs> break free. And so I love anything to do with design personally, right? And and I, and I um, so it was, it's, it's just about the be beauty and simplicity of design. I used to have another boss that said to me, this underpins so much about business success. It sounds like a very trite thing to say, but if you... It's almost like one of those Buddhist things or one of those Zen things that the more you think about it, the more kind of levels are unveiled. But he would say, in business, if it's complex and cumbersome, it's always wrong. So it's not nearly always wrong. Mm -hmm. So in business, if it's complex and cumbersome, it's wrong. If it's simple and elegant, it's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like simplify, 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 make everything simple. And then he would say, so, and that, that would go right down to how do, we, how do we prepare a set of accounts, right? So just our monthly board, board meeting accounts, right? How do we prepare those? We could kill a tree and produce this much, this much data, but somewhere within that data is information somewhere, right? But this isn't information. This is just data. Data is very broad. Information is a subset of data, right? It's much more narrow. And he would say, like, no one's interested in data. Let's let's figure out where the information is. And then he would say, and if an idiot at speed doesn't understand it, so that's not only an idiot, but an idiot that's in a hurry. If they don't understand it, right, it's a bit like JFK. 
said that no word in any of his speeches, and he was talking some tricky stuff, Bay of Pigs time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if if there's, he would say to his speechwriter, if there's any word that a 12 year old doesn't understand, it has to be removed, right? Because you can say the most important and difficult things in a really, really simple way. And I don't mean yeah. dumbing down, I mean yeah. saying it elegantly. And it's the same with data and it's the same with information and it's the same with decision making. And all of that stuff you don't find in a book. We don't, you find in 50 books. Yeah. And a little bit here and a little bit there. And it's maybe something to do, like you said, with the economy, maybe something to do with wildlife, maybe something to do with, I don't know, fracking, right? Whatever, that yeah. is, if there is such a book. Right? And that's where you get all of that stuff. Yeah. And read, yeah. read good stuff, right? Read, read Dilbert. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Right. And Peanuts and Charlie Brown. But, you know, read, read what the real geniuses write. Yeah. And, and, everyone, and I think, wasn't it? I think it was Albert Einstein who said something along the lines of if if you can't explain a complex matter in simple terms, you don't understand it properly yourself. Exactly. And and I love that. And I and at times I'm explaining something to someone. It could be Glenda at home over dinner and right. she'll be looking at me and blinking. And I'm like, I don't I think I need to research this further because I don't think I, I know it well enough to be able to eloquently like relay it to you and self-awareness bit of that i just stop myself i think yeah as soon as i start rambling too much i think it's because i don't really get it enough myself i need to go and dive into it a bit love it love it that that's so good we um mean what you say and say what you mean and understand Mm. it in really really well it's so important and what we one of the other exercises we do with our ceos and leadership team early on is we'll say okay so what's the problem and someone will tell you a problem, right? And they'll go on and on and on and on. They'll either say, well, um, we're not making enough profit. Okay, that's the problem statement. <laughs> okay. Mm. And then some others will just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And and we've all seen those kind of CEOs. You ask them the time and they tell you how the watch works, right? And you're just talking three hours later and okay. And, and, and we'll say to them, hey, listen, when you understand the problem, well enough to define a really good problem statement. And I don't mean pages long. I can't remember who it was that said, and it may have been Einstein, that a problem really well defined is half solved, right? So really understand the problem to the extent that you can succinctly, but eloquently and completely define it, then you're halfway to solving it. So I think Mm. that's that's great, isn't it? Because if you don't know your destination, how how yeah. do you know you're heading in the right direction? That's great, yeah. isn't it? The the, uh, the other going, don't know. Well, go wherever yeah. you want. It's gonna yeah, get you absolutely. The, the other thing that I was thinking, I heard on a podcast a few months ago. I think the guy's name is Joseph Tainter. He's an American guy, oh, and I think yeah. he's come up with Tainter's paradox. I think is how it's or or it's something along that lines. And yeah. and I th- and I think the context is he'd studied um, civilization collapse. And he, his sort of theory is that as, com- as complexity rises, the you get diminishing returns from the level of complexity to a yeah. point where you end up you end up with empire collapse or you know yeah. biological collapse or whatever. And, and and I was talking to some people in the office about this because I think the same the, the same could be true to anything. You know, you, it's a bit like with all of the new technology coming out. You know, I'm not I'm not anti tech in any way, but as we get more complex with our with the AI and the algorithms, does it make us more money? Does it make us more efficient? Does it mean we use less resource material, or does it just become more and more complex and we get diminishing returns? And and then almost bringing it back to what you were saying there. You know, the defining the problem. At times, I think there's a danger that as leaders, we can just throw technology at things and make it more and more complex Yeah, yeah. because we think it's going to solve the problem. But it actually just means we get diminishing returns and we add layers of cost and complexity. No one really understands it. And you know, I, I fear this could be a real t- a decade of that happening within business if the leaders don't take that step back and say, OK, how, how do we use the complexity, but to our advantage, not just for the sake of the complexity? Love it. What most, I think most too, too broad, what a lot of forward thinking organizations are doing, and probably for about two years now, and it's, it's a trend I see, just one of those kind of, you know, it's almost like a logarithmic curve and it'll just, you know, gather momentum very, very, very quickly, <coughs> is they're recruiting senior 
um, individuals now. Specifically, they'll tell the headhunters and uh, people like that that they're particularly looking for insight and emotional intelligence, insight and EQ. Mm. So in the past, coming back to what we were talking about at the, at the top of the uh, conversation, we, they would, people would be employed based on IQ and kind of, you know, time served, right? So mm. how long have they been around? How are they doing? And, and actually, there is a great model called the PIE model, P-I-E. I don't know if you know the PIE leadership model. The, the talks about everybody seems to think that, um, you know, if somebody does well in their job, then they'll get promoted and good things will happen and they'll do well. In other words, it's all related to performance. Now, you and I both know that that's not true because sometimes you look at some leaders and you think, how on earth did they get there, right? You look at some other people who are like really talented and, and kind of stuck, right? So everybody thinks it's all based on performance. And if they do well, if they do their job well, then good things will happen. But the PIE model says, well, actually, performance is only a tiny part of it. The other two things, PIE is P-I-E, it's about image and exposure, right? Are you managing your image well? And, and are you exposing yourself, you know, to the right kind of people in the right kinds of way? And performance is, I think, from memory, 20, or maybe it's less than that, 15 or 20%. Image is something like 40%, and the rest is kind of like exposure. It's like who you're hobnobbing with. But the point is that there are some people that have managed their careers pretty well in that way. And then there are others who've taken the IQ route, right? Technical skill and experience. And that'll get me there because I've been doing this a long time. Mm. But these days, in much more modern thinking, is it's about insight and emotional intelligence. So Coca-Cola started investigating this. I think it was in the 80s where they looked at all of their, you know, Coca-Cola is a massive company. It's not just, it's not just Coke, right? It's Fanta and Danone yeah. and DeSanti and all of that. There's millions of food and genius organization, Coca-Cola. I, I love nearly everything to do with Coca-Cola, apart from the product, right? <laughs> which is weird. But as far as the way that they run their organization, it's like Mars. I mean, you've got to really admire how they do things, right? And the, 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 like the vision statement for Coca-Cola um, is to be within an arm's reach of desire. That means that whenever anyone thinks, oh, I'll have some Coca-Cola, they, they, they only have to do that, right? We can kind of grab a Coke, which I love, and it, it informs everything that they do. To the extent that there is now a town built in Atlanta where services into the house of water, electricity, and gas, all those utilities, and Coke. And I don't mean Coke is in the garage in a big bottle. They turn on a tap and Coca-Cola comes out, right? That's, that's come from the source, right? Like a reservoir of Coca-Cola or something. I don't know. Now, part of your listeners will be thinking, that's absolutely horrific. And it is but genius at the same time, right? So a lot of these companies started with Coca-Cola. They advertise a senior role and they get thousands, like tens of thousands of people applying and they can pick the brightest and the best across the world, right? It's the same with Microsoft, it's Gillette, Kellogg's, all of those kind of like really branded, you know, well-known organizations. So Coca-Cola were employing the brightest people they could find, right? Harvard, Princeton, Cambridge, right? The, the guys with the MBAs and the doctorates, the smartest people in the world, because they've got a thousand, probably more CVs to choose from. Let's go for the smartest people, right? The most quote unquote talented individuals. So they did that for a while. And then they saw that some of their divisions weren't performing quite as so well as they thought that perhaps that they might. And they, they said, well, is there any link between well-performing divisions or what is the link between divisions that are doing well and divisions that aren't doing well across the world? They discovered that all of the divisions that were doing well, the, the senior leaders had good insight, and we'll talk about insight later, perhaps, if you like, and high emotional intelligence. And the ones that were performing poorly, right, were all the ones with the quote unquote technical skills and experience and IQ, right? And they... To the extent that by the time they finished the research, that they found that all of the recruitment going forward was much more important. They were much more interested in, in, in people who had good insight skills and who had 
good emotional intelligence as opposed to IQ. It comes back to what you said earlier, because we're all kind of born, like if you have an IQ of 110 when you're eight, when you're 38, it's still 110, and when you're 58, it's still 110, right? Because IQ is kind of stamped on your DNA, and there's not much you can do about that. But EQ, you can absolutely develop that like a lunatic, right? Such that your EQ grows, right? So that's not fixed, you know, it's not stamped on your DNA. Comes back to the, are leaders born or are they made? They're absolutely made, right? They're not born, not, the leaders aren't just those with a, the God gene, right, that's stamped on their DNA, the leadership gene that, you know, that, that God gave them. And the ones that seem to do well, well, not seem, very tightly correlated are the ones that have good emotional intelligence, as a, EQ as opposed to IQ. No, that, I mean, I think this is going to link back to something you mentioned earlier um, in your early career, the reason your, your boss at the time liked you because you were truthful. And I think we. I think there's a segue here between EQ um, and truth and trust. Um, I mean, that the, they look completely linked to me. I don't know if you want to expand on that. They are completely linked. Again, one of the first questions, and I learned this. So I'll tell you how I learned it in a minute. You know, for all of the leaders and managers listening to this, this is uh, a rather sobering thought. So I, so I was asked this, and I asked this, right? So. Of all of the people, when we work, when we start working with them, I'll ask them, what percentage of the time do you think your people tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You, you can see it flash across their eyes when they kind of think, crikey, it's probably not nearly as high as I would like it to be, or I perhaps mm. to imagine that it was. It's not 100%. It never is, okay? But then, then neither is it 0%. So it's somewhere in, in between. We'll ask them, okay, well, what do you think it is? I mean, you know, have a guess. So let's imagine then that it's 75%. Somebody says, well, probably 75%. And um, we'll go with that, right? It's not to argue about the percentage because it's an unknown. But the fact is that your people will tell you a version of the truth that they think it's in their best interest to have you believe, right? So let's imagine that it's 75%. We would then argue, well, you know what? Your job is to figure out or at least try and close that 25% gap, right? Because there's probably some magic in there, the stuff that they're not kind of volunteering, right? Mm. And and I love the story, I think I mentioned this to you in the past, about how George Bush, you know, the ex-president George Bush, senior, who was in a pro-am golf tournament, he was no longer the president. He 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 walked off the 18th green and somebody shoved a camera in his face and said, How was the how was the golf, Mr. President? Americans still call ex-presidents, Mr. President. How was the golf, Mr. President? And he thought about it for a second and he said, it's amazing how many games of golf he's lost since leaving the White House, right? And I thought, oh yeah, reasonably amusing principle. But here's the problem. In all of my times of being a leader, and I've asked uh, maybe 200 leaders, right? So not a great percentage, but the answer was overwhelmingly the same. When I've, I've asked them, hey, George, when was the last time somebody came into your office, knocked on your door and said, hey, boss, have you got five minutes? And you said, yeah, sure, come in, sit down, make you know, my open door policy. You know what it's like around here. What's on your mind, Frank? And then, George, and then Frank says, well, yeah, George, I've been watching your performance over the last six months or so. Um, and I thought I'd just come and share with you today that I think you're doing an absolute terrible job. I think when this was wrong, that was awful. This was dreadful. That was despicable. That was awful. And that was terrible. And I just thought you should know. And I said, so how often do people tell you that? Because it's very hard to tell someone you've got an ugly baby, right? So how often does that happen? And that never happens. And occasionally someone will say, well, yeah, somebody came in and suggested that maybe that decision wasn't right. I said, yeah, that's not what I just asked you, right? Maybe suggesting kind of half hinting at is not the level of truth that, that, that I'm after. So, George, what's your strategy for truth, right? If, they're only, if you're only getting a version of the truth that they think it's in their best interest to have you believe, what's your strategy for truth? And while we're at it, George, What's your strategy for tr for trust? And I can't think of one leader that told me either that had an answer for either of those questions. And the purpose of asking the question is not to kind of trap someone. I'm not trying to 
generate gotcha moments. I'm like, do you take this stuff seriously or not? Do you think it's yeah. important that people tell the truth to each other in your organization? Do you think it's important that they trust each other? Because if you want a collaborative organization, which is much more efficient and effective than a cooperative organization, right? And just go to, if anybody wants to read around that, the guy that saved Lego, right? Just Google the guy that saved Lego. It's a tremendous story about how the guy that saved Lego was working very hard on this principle of collaboration and trust and truth. Anyway, back to the question, what's your strategy for truth? They go, well, I don't think I have one. Okay, what's your strategy for trust? And I don't think I have one of those either. And so that's one of the things that we talk about. I, I remember I, I said to a particular CEO, well, how about only telling your people the truth? How about starts with you, right? How about you start telling people the truth? He says, I, uh, that's all I do, very puffy, right? <laughs> that's all I ever do. And well, it's interesting that I said, because one of your directors told me that they found out about a recent acquisition after they read it in the press. And that would have been planned for months in advance. Okay, and suddenly we got a very crestfallen CEO that goes, oh, you mean the truth, truth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right, the real truth, right? Uh, of course, regulations and all of that kind of stuff, maybe you have to be a little bit circumspect with it, but, but why don't you start by telling, you know, People will watch what you do much more than they listen to what you say as leaders. And a lot of leaders, they judge others by their actions, but they judge themselves by their intentions, right? Which is completely wrong, right? And so, yeah, start by telling the truth. Start by trusting people. A, C, uh, a chairman, a group chairman, came into my office one day. I kid you not. He said, so I was, I was the MD or the CEO, depending on which country you're listening at. So I was the managing director. Chairman came in, sat in my office, and he said, did you know, but very indignant, did you know that this individual, let's say Angie, that wasn't her real name, uh, wasn't at work yesterday? And I said, uh, no, no, I, I didn't know that. And he said, yeah, her uncle died, and she took the day off to go to the funeral. I said, oh, that's terrible. Let's call him George. It wasn't his name. I said, oh. George, that's terrible. He said, yes. And what are you going to do about it? And I said, oh, I'm, um, well, I'll have to get, and I made a note, send flowers to Angie, right, from the organization, mm -hmm. right? And he said, no, no, you misunderstand. And he got out the company handbook, which, staff handbook, which looked like the New York Yellow Pages, by the way. It's like this thick. And he went, and he went from the index, and he found... The, the place the place that says how much time you can take off for you know breathe. Right. yeah there is a word for it and hr people are screaming um compassionate leave yeah compassionate leave that's exactly <laughs> right i was going to say that screaming is some kind of politically correct way of saying what i just said right and 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 he got there and a and big pen was written was the circle and it was said you know spouses children um mothers fathers and and it's like and he was like and there's no uncle on the list. So what are you going to do? I said, oh, well, okay. I need to uh, I need to go and have a word with, what did I say, Angie? Did I say Angie? Angie, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I need to go and have a word with Angie. And he thought I was going to go and berate her and tell her how sorry we are. And he was like looking slightly confused. And then the next thing I need to do is change the compassionate leave. So that includes aunties and uncles and all that kind of stuff. And he went, no, Antonio, you, you, missing on, you misunderstand me completely, completely. And I said, no, George, you misunderstand everybody else completely, right? Because how much did he trust his people? How much did his people yeah. trust him? The, the staff handbook looked like the New York Yellow Pages, if there is such a thing anymore, right? God, how old am I, right? But anyway, I, I nearly said the Encyclopedia Britannica, but they don't think that exists. Right? <laughs> well, that's how ancient I am. But anyway, it was a weighty term. It had broken your foot if you yeah. dropped it on your foot, right? Whenever he said anything, everybody took it like with a you know huge pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. Nobody trusted him. Nobody was truthful with him, right? Why? Because it has to start at the top. 
right? Your yeah. strategy for trust should be, why don't you start trusting your people as a good place to start? Mm-hmm. Why didn't your strategy for trust as a good place to start, start telling your people the truth, start telling them the truth, right? Warts and all, good, bad, and indifferent, right? Not just rah, rah, rah all the time, glad, jazz yeah. handsing everything, right? Tell them the truth, right? They'll respect you a lot more for it. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting when you were talking there, but I, I was thinking, what did I do with my team over the years around trust and truth? And I realized that I hadn't posed those questions, but about, I don't know, 12 years ago, right. my business coach at the time said, I think you'd really enjoy and benefit from reading a book by a guy called John Seddon, Freedom from Command and Control. So I read the book and, and I'd always, I always struggled with the command and control structure. It just didn't fit with my kind of slightly wild free spirit side of things. Um, And I read the book and I thought, yeah, just completely get it. So I I went around within my direct team at the time, I spoke, spoke to the management team about it and basically it was i want to break any remnants of command and control that we had within our team um we wanted a flat structure it doesn't mean you haven't still got people with different experience levels but it's more the mindset and how you measure things within the team and and i think inadvertently i think that then led to greater transparency and truth and greater trust within the team because we you know, because as you were talking about that story there as soon as soon as someone says this is what the procedure manual says yeah. that just rings out command and control to yeah. me it's like right we've got to drive this down and and antonio you you're my number two you've got to drive it down and it's just yeah, yeah, command yeah, and control yeah. stuff you know the the principle that you know they they listen to they watch what you do much more than they listen to what you say so i can quite imagine that it never happened. But George berating Angie, you know, prior to my arrival, for having taken that time off to go to her uncle's funeral. But then can I absolutely imagine George having done exactly the same thing if his uncle had died, right? No question. Yeah. But then at the same time, they want this collaborative enterprise. And they want this, they want everybody to work together harmoniously and they want people to get very creative and they want people to take you know risks would you would anybody ever take risks that individual no because all 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 that will happen is as soon as you go outside the tram lines you're in trouble i had another boss right who years prior to that talked about a couple of things i i i came to him a very early on in a in a senior role and i said Tell me a little bit about the culture of the organization. I said, sure, yeah, what do, you want, what do you need to know? And I said, well, there are some organizations really take the, the carrot approach to encouraging people, right, and motivating people. And then there are some that kind of take the stick, stick approach. Mm. Uh, are, are we a carrot, right? What's this culture like? Is it more carrot or is it more stick? And he said, you know, in my experience, the best way to motivate people, he says, is to beat them to death with carrots, right? Which I, which I love as a principle, right? Because it's just like, just whenever you see anything good, reward, because what gets rewarded gets repeated, right? So just reward it like crazy, doesn't matter where it comes from. Anything good, let's reward like crazy. And then if you see anything bad, kind of tell them what good looks like, show them what good looks like, and once they understand what that is, they will do more of that. Second thing is loose tight. He said, if you give somebody, this comes back to George, right? If you give somebody a box and say, fill that box, right? So it could be to a sales guy, your sales target is X, right? Or you say to manufacturing and logistics, uh, your OTIF, your on time and full target is 94%, right? If you give people these really tight parameters, then unless they're, you know, a bit foolish or incompetent, they will fill that box and get all of the attaboys and all the bonuses and all Mm. the positions and all of the good stuff that go along with, you know, getting a tick in their box. That's tight. But this leader said, have it loose before it's tight. So if you don't say to the sales guy, what should... uh, your target is 100,000 or a million, whatever it is. Rather, you say, if you were in charge, what would it be? And how would that happen? And what does that look like, right? Or if you said to the logistics and manufacturing people, what should our OTIF be? Instead of saying it should be 94, I want 94, right? 
Um, so it's loose. They'll often come up with, okay, my target should be 2 million. And someone will say 98%, right? Because you're not actually being super prescriptive. So it's kind of loose, tight and loose, tight. And I love that way of allowing people, because one of the things that people want, and there's lots of research, when you go to leaders and you say, what do you want from your people? Typically, you ask enough of them and, and, and four things appear. They want people who are self-sufficient with a high degree of skill and a high degree of motivation and some kind of tenure and going to stick around for a bit, right? So they want people who are self-sufficient, in other words, can get on with stuff, with high degree of skill, so does, you know they do good stuff, High degree of motivation, do lots of it and stick around, right? So that we can look after them and develop them and promote them and we don't have to, because bad hires, ugh, don't get me started on that, right? But then when you ask individuals, let's let's unpick those four from the leadership perspective, then let's unpick them from the individual's perspective. So the leader wants self-sufficiency, but the individual wants autonomy. They want a feeling of autonomy. They want to be able to feel that they're not being micromanaged Someone isn't breathing down their neck every day and they can just kind of get on with stuff, right? So self-sufficiency on one side and autonomy on the other side. Well, that's the same thing, right? Just through the different ends of the telescope. Next thing is the individual wants, they, they, they want to feel that they can manage what it is that they're, they're doing. So skill and, you know, their ability to manage. I once went skiing, we ski from Italy to France. And I was in the wrong group. It, I was in the top group. I don't know why, but it just kind of happened. And I shouldn't have been there. And every time we got to the next kind of like rest stop, I don't, I don't want to say pit stop because it feels like we we're in the middle of nowhere, right? So we got to the next kind of safe place to, to stop. I was always the last one down, right? And they were just like zooming off. You know, if you've ever been skiing and you see these three-year-olds, right, with no poles and sticks, and they're almost like skiing backwards and kind of reading a book as the skiing, right? I was, I was always the last one there. And I said to the instructor on this particular day, right, I, I'm like, they were just skiing like beautifully. And I'm, and I'm like sweating like a pig, right? Thinking I'm going to die every five seconds. And I say, and I said to him, this isn't very good, is it? I'm not very good at this, am I? And he said, well, it's less skiing and more crisis management, which is how he described my skiing, right? And I just thought, that's great. So come back to... You know, that's not what people want to feel. They don't want to feel that every day is crisis management and every day is running out of control and spinning out of control and they can't keep their hands on all the plates, right? So self-sufficiency, right, and mastery are the same kind of thing. Then we want motivation from our people. We want our people to be very motivated. But what do they want? They want a feeling of a sense of purpose, right? Because purpose and motivation are also the same thing. And it's our yeah. job to help do that. We want people with tenure and they want to feel that they're progressing right to the level that they want to progress. Not everybody wants to be the CEO. Not everybody wants to do that, but they are that they are progressing, even if it's only, you know, in terms of, you know, recognition. So we all want the same thing. Right. So if we all want the same thing, we want those four things and they want those four things. Then it can't be beyond the wit of man to make that happen. Right. And it's our job to make that happen. So purpose and motivation, all of those things, people's skills, developments, uh, motivation, the tenure, culture, all of those things live with the leader. And if you do it in this loose, tight way, where you management, where you practice management by exception, which is so long as you're within 80% of this target and 17% of this target and 104% of this target, whatever those brackets look like, then we don't even have to talk about it, right? We'll just do a check-in. And But if anything ever falls outside of those brackets, that turns into a management by exception because it's now not within the bracket. So it, 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 it triggers an exception alert. Then we'll deal with it, right? So just micromanagement, command and control that you talked about, just dreadful ways to run organizations. And we, we, we rail against that very, very much. Well, I, I do not know where the last hour has gone, Antonio. We, this has been fascinating. There's so much more we could have covered, which we thought we were going to, and we've got nowhere near it today. 
So I'd like to move into our final two stock questions, if that's okay. And, and maybe there's a part two to this. So uh, yeah. uh, we, we'll, we will have to see if our diaries match up again. So, so moving on to the yeah. two questions, which we did we did pre-warn you uh, around and uh, the listeners would expect nothing else than these last two questions. So if you were going to recommend three books, podcasts, movies, clips off YouTube, TEDx talks, whatever it might be around this topic, what, what would you recommend to the listeners? TEDx which yeah, who doesn't love TEDx, right? There is a, an Israeli composer uh, called Talgam, T-A-L-G-A-M, who talks about leadership from the perspective of a composer. I'm sorry, conductor of an orchestra. And it's the closest, you know, a lot of people talk about leadership that it's like sport or military. They use lots of those analogies. The closest one I've ever heard is conducting an orchestra, right? Where mm. the, the conductor, you know, people see the thing that they see in the performance and think, is that all he does? He just waves his stick around. But it that belies all of the work and hard work that's gone in advance of that. And plus, the conductor doesn't play any of the instruments better than any of them. They all do that better than he does. They're all functionally better violinists and pianists and cellists than he will ever be, right? So anything by Talgam, just go on to TEDx and just look Talgam composer, uh, conductor, which is just uh, phenomenal. In terms of books, holy moly, apart from mine, obviously, where would I start? Um, I think the book I've read more than any book is The One Thing. And, and I think the book the one thing is the book that changed my life, right? Genuinely changed my life. Um, and there aren't many books that really can change your life. The one thing changed my life. Closely followed by 10x is easier than 2x, which is just phenomenal. And then you eat the big fish. I don't know if you've read that. It's about challenger brands. I love challenger brands i'm not a big fan of massive monolithic you know i'm not i, I like i like avis much more than i like hertz for example where avis say you know avis admit you know we're number two so we try harder i love that right so i just love that approach and and i think as humans we tend to we tend to want the scrappy David to beat the Goliath every time, don't we? Maybe it's a British thing. Yeah. I don't know. But maybe it's not so American. They kind of want that. They want Goliath to win. But I think Brits want David to win, right? We all we all back the scrappy underdog, I think. Yeah. So uh, challenger brands, I love. Businesses that are built on solid marketing uh, philosophies are, all, always do well. Always do well. So, so I, anything by Seth Godin, anything, by, right? Purple Cow, probably read that fifteen times. So, yeah, um, yeah I think I'd say that. Yeah, I, and actually, I'm, this, I'm reading this probably the third time. Servant Leadership in Action, which is about fifty um, uh, thoughts from fifty different leaders about servant leadership. That's really what. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, you were struggling. Uh, no, I was just saying, I'm with you. If, if someone said to me three books, etc., I, I I'd be struggling because there's so many at different points in my life. Yeah. But thank you for those. They're, they're good ones. And there's a couple yeah. of those I haven't read, so I will definitely get those. So so just moving into the final question now, if you could transport yourself back in time and talk to an 18 year old Antonio, what three bits of advice, pearls of wisdom would would you try and impart on yourself? So. First one is the um, advice that my dad gave me when I got married. Like I was just about to, you know, walk into the church. My dad said, and he'd been married forever, right, to my mum, obviously. <laughs> and um, he gave me uh, a few pieces of advice. The one that I think is I've used more often than not in my life and and in my coaching, in my in my career, in my business as well. And this is so true for so many leaders. But anyway, it goes like this. When you find yourself rowing about the shoes on the floor, find out what you're rowing about because it isn't the shoes on the floor. So that was his advice for marriage. But I think that's, an, I think that's advice for life, right? You look at the moment about all of the protests that was probably going to date this podcast, you know, Israel and Gaza and Palestine. That's a perfect example. Russia, 
Ukraine. When you find yourself worrying about the shoes on the floor, find out where your iron works. It's not the shoes on the floor, mm -hmm. right? There's always something else. Find out what that is. Fix the real problem, I guess, is what we talked about earlier when we talked yeah, about problems. absolutely. So going back to Antonio, I have 18 year old. I don't want you to think I was a hothead because I wasn't. I was always fairly relaxed, but I wish I'd learned earlier to figure out the real issue, if that makes sense. What, yeah. you know, what's really going on. The, the other thing I would say, and I guess I have to say this, but I wish I had, I would tell the, my 18-year-old self to journal because it probably took me about 15 yeah. years after that before I actually met the, the guy that first encouraged me to do it, right? And so I have, I don't know, let's say 20 years worth of journals, right? But I could easily have had 40 years of journals. Do you know what I mean? Um, so... I think that's so, so, so important, not only for self-awareness and emotional intelligence and all of those kind of things, but one of the biggest kicks I get is reading back on the on seeing how I've learned and grown and developed over the, say, the last 10 or 12 years. Um, not only that, uh, there's a client of ours who journals maybe six months ago said, hey, listen, is there any way we can have all of these leather bound? Because I, I want to put them, I want to leave, I want to bequeath them to my kids. Because I would love to know what my dad was thinking 30 years ago, right? But there's no record yeah. of that. But I would love to know what he thought about the world, what he thought about da -da 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 -da, all of these kind of things. And so he's putting it in his will. And I thought, well, isn't that great? I would love mm -hmm. to. Not that my kids would be even bothered, right? Maybe they'll just use it to stop a wobbling chair or something. But mm -hmm. I'm, I would love to. So journal. The other piece of advice, I think, is which I also still use to this day. When we get all so busy, and I feel like I've been busy my whole life, like busy, 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 you know, right? So my dad said, so it, it came from my dad, who was super duper wise. So I'll give you how my dad positioned it, then I'll tell you the way that I now position it. But my dad said, there aren't many, there aren't too many people who on the deathbed wish they'd spent more time at the office, right? So, so get your work-life balance right. I would tell that to my 18-year-old self, right? And you probably think, gosh, didn't you have fun? Oh, yeah, I did. But right, I also kind of worried about too many things. There aren't many people on their deathbed that wish they'd spent more time in the office. The way that I talk about that now to all of my leaders is if you think you, ha you can't find time for your wellness, eventually you'll be forced to find time for your illness. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's so true. When so many leaders are working so hard, and I think that's another piece of it. Not that I'm ill. Right, not that I'm unwell, yeah. but I don't think I got my work-life balance right. In fact, I know I didn't. So, I, I love that. that. That's that's what a fantastic piece of advice to finish the podcast on. That that will resonate with a lot of leaders listening to it. It resonates with me. I'm sure it will with a lot of the listeners. So, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. This has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed this discussion. It's been so much uh -huh. amount of value to the listeners, and we barely touched the top of this. It was fantastic. So, if if the listeners want to find out more about you and my daily leadership, where's the best place for them to find you? So for sure, find me on LinkedIn. Find me on Amazon Books, right? So I've got three books, but just go to www. All the Ws, mydailyleadership.com, mydailyleadership.com. Or even better, just send me an email, antonio at mydailyleadership.com, and I promise I'll get back to you. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure and hopefully we'll speak soon. It's been a hoot. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. If you have, please rate us and review us on your platform of choice. If you can give us a five-star rating, then it really does help other people find this show. A massive thank you to our sponsors, Larkin Gowan. Have a look in the show notes to the link to their website to see how their team of experts can help you and your business. That just leaves us to say have a great week and boost your health, wealth and self.